Information Security Hot Tub, Episode 4, Practice Safe Penetration Testing and Vulnerability Reporting. Okay, looks like we have quite a few people here. Um, I know it's been uh, a lot of people have a little bit of a busy night tonight. So thank you so much, everybody that's here, um, either as a speaker or just listening in. Um, tonight's space is going to be a little bit different. Allie had a great, awesome idea of kind of diving in to see how a lot of people kind of hone and practice their skills here in InfoSec, um, whether that's going to be red team or blue team. So I'll definitely kind of pass the reins off to her. Um, but yeah, so let's jump in. Ali, do you want to introduce yourself? And then we'll get started to learn more about our uh, speakers as well. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I am um, super excited to be hosting this, um, <laughs> this uh, space. Um, I actually so I have a story about why I wanted to host the space, and I'd really like to share it with y'all. Um, so... <laughs> Um, I have had a, an interest in pen testing and fighting vulnerabilities for a while, but what really made me drive me to do this space was, um, I got rejected from a dating app and I was like, what if I found a vulnerability in the dating app and then told them about it as a way to get access to the dating app so they would let me on by finding a vulnerability? And I know that's so silly, but... This is what inspired this app, so I hope you all find it funny because I think it's really funny too. Um, I came up with a whole list of questions that I'm super excited to be here to ask. Um, I know that it's generally a lot less formal, but um, I came up with a bunch of different questions. I'd be happy to ask our panelists and then have like a Q&A session if y'all are chill with that. I mean, I'm, I'm ready to ask these questions. I wrote them all up, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, I don't know. I guess I'll just start with asking the panelists. So if y'all just want to do like a quick introduction and maybe just drop like what's your favorite pen testing tool just so that we could figure out who's here and who's speaking today. So I'll start with Davin. Hi, everybody. I'm Davin Jackson. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I've been doing pen testing now for about uh, almost almost 10 years. Um I've done pen testing for uh, consultancies. I've been like an in-house pen tester, <clears throat> internal red team. Uh, and now I work uh, as an application security engineer um, for a financial company. And I handle a lot of the pen testing, their applications and their APIs. Uh, as far as uh, tools that I use, um, I'm, <laughs> I've been using Burp Suite a lot. So I'll I'll just uh, say that I'm you know Burp Suite and Postman for for my API pen testing, and I'm happy to be here and and help any way I can. Um, awesome, uh, oh, Beatrix, do you want to jump on? Um, hi, I am Kalila. Uh, most people call me Kiki. I am currently a security compliance analyst with GHX and a current student with uh, Purdue University Global, set to graduate in about four weeks. Um, I am not a pen tester. However, I do have some insights, GRC-wise, compliance-wise, security-wise, um, for anybody that wants some information. Awesome. Uh, Rhea? Hey. Good evening, everyone. So my name is Rhea. Um, I am not a professional pen tester either, um, but I do have some experience with pen testing. And I'd say my favorite tool, I know Davin just said Burp Suite, which is like the most common tool, but it's like one of the best tools. Um, I'd say Metasploit is definitely a lot of fun. Um, I think everyone should know Metasploit at least. So yeah, so that's a little bit about me. Awesome. Eric? Hello, everybody. Um, Eric Bilardo. Uh and uh, I am not currently a pen tester, but used to do it back in my youth. I've been doing this for 32 years. And uh, my favorite tools are the old Saint and Satan. Um, and if you don't know, go ahead and Google. That's history. Um, so I'm glad to be here as well. Awesome. And Jake? 
Yeah, hey guys. Um, nice to uh, nice to be invited to talk on this. Totally an honor. Um, but I am I am a uh, pen tester. I'm actually a little bit uh, green in the space. Um, I work at uh, NetSpy uh, with Parker, um, so that's kind of how I uh, got in here. Um, but I don't want to don't want to beat a dead horse and say Burp Suite again. But I've been uh, I've been really digging down on Burp Suite. Um, I got to say, outside of Burp Suite, favorite tools probably going to be Nmap, just old reliable. Awesome. Um, so I guess for this question, um, of this will apply to a few people, but I'm super curious to hear how has pen testing um, in your own time or just outside of work or it, during work, how has that changed or influenced your own career? Um, if anyone wants to jump, and I feel like Eric is going to have some really great stories here. Oh, was that a hint? All right. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, in my career for so long, um, I've uh, worked with uh, a lot of different areas uh, within pen testing, without the red team, without, um, you know, the AppSec team. And actually, one of my, the highlights of my career, which will, uh, I think Davin can speak a lot about this much more than I do, but um, I had an experience with um, having to set up the application security for the World Bank. And um, we had, on a weekly basis, we had to scan 1,500 websites and do AppSec uh, of all the new and emerging tools. So we had about 300 tools and 1,500 websites that rotated within every, every month that we had to do. So a lot of tools that we use, um, you know, we, we didn't mention here, but one of the tools that I used there was Core Impact, which was great for the website scanning um, at the time. And this is, a, a you know, 10 plus years back. Um, and so being able to work on the call it the front end or or the door to a lot of these applications at that time when you know OWASP was starting to 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 be built and being part of those groups uh, building OWASP and being part of those uh, those working groups for those vulnerabilities um, it was it was a great time in my career. Um, I, you know, pass the baton to the younger generation, like I call them the next generation of cyber defenders. And um, it was it was definitely a highlight of finding those vulnerabilities, identifying those vulnerabilities and actually making it um, making a change because in that organization, we as the AppSec team had a vote in the um, change management board. So if they were try to do more updates and upgrades to the systems, they would have to get an AppSec um, test. And if we didn't pass them, they didn't get past co uh, their configuration management board. So that doesn't occur very much, as Davin can probably tell you. Okay. Yeah, no, that 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 doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> um, if I was just if if I was to just stick to the the question uh, first about how pen testing has uh, changed or altered, um, I guess, my career. Um, I would have to say that pen testing or at least being introduced to pen testing definitely changed my career trajectory because um, when I first started in tech, uh, I started off basically doing, you know, repair bench and then moved my way up to help desk, desktop support and kind of worked up to sysadmin. And um, <clears throat> honestly, it kind of got boring. Um, I'm not knocking anybody who does sysadmin work or anything like that, but um, I I wanted to be engaged in, in, in a little bit more. And um, I think when when people get into cybersecurity or pen testing, I say we all have this this itch that needs to be scratched in the back of our brain. And um, I couldn't I couldn't scratch that itch doing um, the, the sysadmin work that I was doing. And I was working at a school system at the time and trying to figure out why you know, our stuff kept breaking and looking into patch management. Then I, then I came across doing um, vulnerability assessments. And once I 
looked into vulnerability assessments, that's when I was introduced to pen testing. And when I started to kind of research it, I was hooked. And um, I actually, <clears throat> at that point, um, tried to get my my job to help pay for the training and, and the books and everything. And at that point, they said, oh, no, that was a little bit too expensive. You know, at the time, Microsoft certifications were like two or three hundred dollars a pop and they were OK paying that. Uh, but then when I decided I wanted to look into more cybersecurity stuff, they were like, oh, that's too expensive. So I actually had to come out of my own pocket and do a lot of studying. And the more I invested time in learning about it, the more I realized that, yeah, this is this is where I want to be. If it wasn't pen testing, it was going to be uh, digital forensics. Um, and I, like I said, I read a bunch of books and built my lab um, and, and started honing my skills that way. Uh, shortly after that, I went and got my CEH, um, labbed for like another three, four months and landed my first junior pen tester role shortly after that. Like I said, it's just kind of been taken off from there. And like I said, just just the everyday challenge of learning something new in pen testing, um, knowing that, you know, a vulnerability or, or an exploit might work today that might not work, but then there might be a new exploit that comes out next week that's, that's just as cool. Um, you know, th those type of things just kind of excite me. Um, and that's pretty much in a nutshell, <laughs> I guess, how pen testing came to be uh, in, in, in my career. And yeah, like I said, now I, I, I test I, I test applications now for their security. Um, and like Eric said, yeah, we, we we're definitely fighting to, to make certain changes. And there's a lot more red tape now than there was when Eric was uh, in, 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 in that field. So I uh, hope I answered the question. Yeah, I'm, yeah, definitely. Y'all definitely jumped on and answered. And I kind of want to lean more into talking about the red tape. So something that I've personally always been super anxious about is that. Red and um, I would love to hear from everyone how they sort of start off if they're doing pen testing in their own free time or navigating these more complex situations. How do they pick what they're going to go after? Um, so do you look for bug bounties or if you have a target in mind, like how do you, how do you decide you should go for that to, to figure out the vulnerabilities? Um, okay. I, I was going to say, uh, typically what I do or what I've done, and I still tell people who I help on the side, um, you're not going to know everything and you're not going to get root just off the rip so let so get that out of your head and don't feel discouraged when you get um what i typically tell people when i when i got started we didn't have like try hack me like try hack me is an, an awesome resource to have now because there's there's a community behind it there's different rooms they have different uh vulnerable machines and ctfs in the try hack me on the try hack me platform but um I tell people, depending on where you want to start, I would say um, look at sites like um, Over the Wire and and learn the the, the Linux commands and stuff from that. Um, go on Vulnhub if you're if you're really gonna build a lab. Go go on Vulnhub, download a couple um, CTF machines on Vulnhub. Um, and set them up in your own virtual environment. Download VirtualBox or VMware, uh, the free version, and just download. Just download a bunch of them. And then on top of downloading those, um, also look up the and if there's any uh, if anyone typed up a walkthrough on how they got root on the machine. Now, you don't have to follow it uh, word for word, but you can use it as a resource if you get stuck. Um, and now you and, and then what what that does is it introduces you to different tools. It introduces it might it might show you something that you didn't know a tool that you thought you were familiar with um, can do like, like Nmap. Um, you know, a lot of people, when they just start out, they're just like, Oh, I can just port scan with Nmap, but they don't know that there's a whole scripting engine that can help you, you know, sort out vulnerabilities or that there's different uh, flags that you can use to, to help you uh, get a better scan when, when you're, when you're running the Nmap scans. And these are things that you can learn from practicing with the vulnerable machines, as well as, reading the write-ups and as you get better 
or as you and as you better understand those, you know, the tools and what's going on in some of these vulnerable machines, you start to realize that you you need those walkthroughs less and less. Um, but then the other thing you do is write your own walkthroughs as well, because it kind of build it kind of develops that that muscle memory. Um, it'll help you have a resource that you can just look up whenever you get stuck. And also you're helping the next set of pen testers who may, who may need that walkthrough as well. So, um, I would start from there, um, work your way up. You can check out Vone hub. You can check out over the wire, try hack me. I know people say hack the box has gotten a little bit more beginner, beginner friendly now, but I usually say, wait to use, wait to go on hack the box until you actually have a foundational understanding of what you're doing or what you're looking for um, in a pen test or a CTF. Um, cause that can, that can get discouraging. You go on, on hack the box and it's just like, I, you know, cause there, there aren't really a lot of write-ups unless they're um, retired machines. So um, I would say just wait a little bit before you jump on hack the box um, until you get that understanding, but you can use Lone Hub and try Hack Me over the wire. And, I, and there's there's a bunch of other ones that I'm probably missing right now. Um, when you want to move up to to application testing, like web app pen t- testing, you can go to um, Port Swigger's Web Security Academy. Uh, they already make Burp Suite, so it's it's uh, it's awesome that they actually have their own academy that you can use. You can learn how to use Burp Suite as well as hunt for vulnerabilities, and they teach you how to do that. Um, there's pen tests, there's the, there's pen tester Academy, pen test labs. There's, there's a bunch of different resources out there. So, um, it's just, it just depends on the trajectory you want to, you want to take your, you know, your pen testing career. That was a bit long winded, but, uh, sorry. (laughs) Uh, Kiki has her hands up. Um, the only thing I wanted to kind of piggyback on is when he talked about um, the write-ups. Um, and me from a GRC perspective in this industry is, you know, we can have a bunch of pen testers doing pen tests and, and, and conducting assignments or, or things of that nature. What we really want to focus on as well as the pen test is how we document it. Um, And the reason I say that is because if you want to make a career out of this, you are going to have to know how to document that your findings or anything that you do during that pen test. And not only that, you need to be able to talk and explain some of those things sometimes to those clients in order for you to be successful. We don't talk about the documentation. We don't talk about it enough to where what you're doing is supposed to be something that we can take in a report or from a report or from talking to you with a report um, and also being able to change our, our security posture, our environment and things that we have going on. That's the entire point of us hiring you as a pen tester. So again, coming from a risk management, a GRC area, like that's something that you should also consider as well. And so I'm I'm just glad uh Davin brought that up. I see that Charles has also joined the speaker lineup. Is there anything that you want to add? Because I saw that your mic got unmuted for a few seconds. <laughs> yeah, um definitely um <laughs> pretty much um just a combination of what was already said. But also too, you wanna add to like that would help your career too. I know like we're in the the process of like the pandemic and everything else um, grab a list of different security conferences that you want to attend virtually and start conversation with folks who are actually in the field as well too, and get tips and tricks that way as well too, because you'd be surprised what you can just learn from a conversation on top of that. Um, speaking of like reporting, 
if you want to help, and, and it's truly important with reporting, um, if you want to really get better at reporting, you can use a combination of say you're, you're doing the write-ups, right? Say you're doing the write-up on a blog or you've like done like, um, like hack the box. Let's just say hack the box, for example, and you've actually gained root on the machine. Write port as if you're writing it for a client on that box and then send it to your peers or someone to take a look at it. And that can help. That truly helped me as far as like writing skills as well. That could be something that you can do too to kind of practice, even if you're not on a pen test. Like, say you've gained root access or admin access on a particular box, you can go from that and just say, you know what, I'm going to write a report as if I'm writing it for a client. And then you can send that to, to your peers too. That can kind of help you with reporting because that's truly important, especially in like help in the career of penetration testing is a combination of definitely being able to talk, definitely be able to report on things as well too, and make sure that the, the report can be digested in a manner that everybody can really understand. So you're talking at a, a high level overview, but also providing evidence that you actually did your job. That's pretty much what I got to say for right now. <laughs> yeah, this is great. I mean, I'm seeing a bunch of 100s, which is awesome here. Um, so on a much higher level for pen testing and vulnerability management, I'm super curious to hear um, from an, anyone in the chat um, who here has experience like running a bug brony, bounty program and um uh, being the person who vulnerabilities have been reported to and sort of hearing about your experiences in that role. Oh, nice. No one sick. <laughs> I can't say that I've uh, triaged any, but I've uh, submitted my fair share of dupes, and that's always that's always a fun thing to get back. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess we could talk a little bit about submitting, like, how what was your, pro was this part of, like, a bug bounty, or was this part of you doing your own experience learning on the side, um, and you just happened to find something? I'm super curious to hear if anyone has any stories that align with that. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I can start out, um, but I, I kind of used Bug Bounty um, as a little bit of like a, a side project just to kind of, you know, test things out. Um, very similar to like how you'd use Hack the Box to test things, test your skills, snoop around on the web. It's like, you, I think it's one of the best platforms that you can do things on um, because, you know, Hack the Box and Try Hack Me are, are fantastic resources and I, I absolutely used um, things like that uh, to, to learn um, and gain experience. But I think uh, bug bounties are super unique um, because there's actual uh, company infrastructure that they're giving you access to essentially. And they're, they're allowing you to perform tests um, on with defenses in place um, and, and things that you won't see in an isolated environment. Um, a, a lot of the times like hack the box is fantastic and it's such a good resource, like I said, but the, box in most cases is intentionally vulnerable. Um, there's, you know, maybe a handful of ports open. Um, there's just one and they're, they're kind of hinting you towards something. It's, it's very CTF oriented. Or I think bug bounty differs uh, and is super helpful for um, people that, you know, maybe are a little bit experienced, but, you know, just trying to test their skills as you're working against uh, a, a actual infrastructure. You're working against an actual um, application that has a team of developers behind it that are trying to circumvent all these vulnerabilities. Um, and they're, they're trying uh, to outsmart us and we're trying to outsmart them. So um, I think it does provide a unique uh, training experience. I can't uh, really speak to the triaging aspect of it or um, anything on the receiving end of a bug bounty program, but I do think it is, uh, it's one of the best uh, ways to learn like web-based attacks, web security, um, things like that, because it's, you know, it's, it's 10 times more realistic than um, seeing a WordPress installation from 2004 
on a very easy machine on hack the box and you know those those boxes have their their place um and things but you know you that's going to be a one in a million if you if you see that out there um so it's a little bit of a long-winded answer but <laughs> that, that would be my take on that well oh, um kind of my segments exactly um jake so a combination of um, both. Also, um, I think it's a, it's good to have a healthy mix of of all of it. So like you said, um, it's good that you can do like the CTF style because again, you learn about new tools there, right? You learn about um, different techniques. Even though the the software is older, and I mean CTF is totally different from of course the, the real world pen testing, but it's good to exercise your skills in that area. But it's also and like you said, it's also good to exercise your skill set within like the bug bounties, because again, that's like more so real world type scenarios. And you're actually, and, and that's another place where you can actually, you can write a report on a vulnerability that you actually found, when you can help hone your reporting skills as well too. And of course, if, if it gets to a point where they're actually probably gonna reach out to you or need to communicate with you, or even ask you to present at their maybe company luncheon or however else based on the vulnerability that you found for a particular company that also helps with honing your skills as far as like with public speaking. So I think it's, it's good to have a, a, a healthy mix when you're, when you're building your pen testing career, a healthy mix of different scenarios. And then again, you can also just look for the latest, like say like the latest version, I'm just going to put this out there, the latest version of a piece of software that just probably came out like, and you just start playing around with it and you can discover bugs that way as well, too, as your skills increase. So that's another thing as well, too. So you, you just never know. It's, it's always good to have a, a healthy mix of each scenario because that that help that helps in building up your. I'll say pen testing endurance. <laughs> Yeah, I kind of want to, I'm super curious to dig in more about what you just said, and please, I'd love more speakers involved in this. Um, specifically, you said software that came out last week. New software, new companies, new startups don't necessarily have um, bug bounty programs. So in those situations, how do you start navigating that that that? scenario of digging into new software gotcha so perfect example right and and i'm using myself as an example here so i'm playing around with um it's called fuchsia os it's an os that android's looking to replace well it's a it's a os that google's looking to replace android with right their own custom os instead of having to use the linux kernel they have a GitHub repository, which is open to the public, that I've, I've downloaded and put it into my environment to play around with it, see what kind of bugs I can actually find. That's how, and I'm just using myself as an example because I'm currently going through that now. You know, it's it's newer software. It hasn't been, of course, been deployed to Android phones or anything else, but it was just something that, like, piqued my interest. And I actually downloaded the, the source code and played around with the source code and putting it into the environment and actually trying to test the bugs and see what I can actually find. And if I do find something, I'll definitely write it up and submit it to Fuchsia. But that would be the, the best way if they don't have a bug bounty. But if they have, and a lot of companies, they have like a community version of the software. Perfect example, Burp. With Port Swigger, you version of Burp and the, the professional version. Say that you're you found a bug within Burp itself, just as an example. You know, they might not have a bug bounty for Portswigger might not have a bug bounty for finding vulnerabilities within Burp. But if you happen to discover it within your own environment, you're not attacking anybody else's environment, that would be the safest way. So that would be the, the best way, even if they don't have a bug bounty program, if they have software that you can get from their public GitHub repository, because a lot of companies have that, then that would be the way that you can actually um, test for bugs within their software and then just report it to them. Um, following on that, like what is what happens again, practicing safe pen testing, practicing safe 
what happens if you find something that does involve active things in production, not just something in your local environment? Well, if it's, well, I'm not going to, definitely not going to test against their production environment because the code that, the code that is running, it's a replica of whatever they might have in production. So if I'm running it locally and I'm actually like, hey, here's what this looks like in my environment and it's a replica of your production environment that's happening now, that's more so of a safe mechanism as to me just going and attacking their their live production site, for example. If I have the, the copy of the code that they publicly released, that kind of protects me from that you know, crossing the line pretty much per se. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just going to add one quick thing is that usually you cannot just attack some random website, even if you think it should be attacked for whatever reason. Um, I don't know the full extent of the procedures behind how you would go about if you see a bug on a website, right? Usually the most logical thing is to like reach out (laughs) <laughs> to the to the people or maybe there's like a support email address somewhere um but if you're ethically trying to tell this company like hey i was you know stumbling upon your website and i saw this redirect happen when i did this and that then there should be some way for you to at least in my opinion that's where like these bug bounty programs like hacker one this is where you know it would be a good good way to kind of like work through that system or through those folks to kind of gauge what to do next in a more legal and ethical way. Agreed. One thing to note is that um, if you search ethically reporting vulnerabilities on online, um, just type it into Google, um, many areas of uh, or companies have a method for ethically reporting a vulnerability. Um, on top of that, the NIST and um, the U.S. government has a policy of ethically reporting vulnerabilities. So as long as you follow those, um, those reporting vulnerabilities, you should be good. But let's also reach out or, or think about what happened in Missouri um, of somebody in an ethical vulnerability you know, the, the, the infamous F12 vulnerability and the person got in trouble. So um, there look at the vulnerability disclosure laws in whatever state you are or company you are and follow those. Um, there are there are guidelines out there and there are a lot of companies do appreciate that, but only when it's followed through those those types of uh, of rules and regulations. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think that, that F, the F-12 situation is a really great example of that, of, of sort of what I'm asking is like you find something in prod and then uh, you ethically report it. Like, how do you navigate that safely? Like you, you're just trying, I'm not saying anywhere attacking. I'm just saying like, how do you ethically make sure that you're doing it and safely? So I think that that's a really great bring up that you brought there. But Davin, I think you have something you wanted to add. Oh, no, I was going to say, um, if you can avoid it, never test and prod for the love of everything sacred and holy. Please never <laughs> test it if you don't have to. I we, we can have a completely different talk about some horror stories. Um, and if you have to test and prod, make sure you have explicit permission to test and prod, um, get it, get it in writing, get it verbal. If you can record their voice, just, you, just it just opens up a whole can of worms that you don't want to happen. Um, typically, anything that can testing in production will happen in testing in production, and they will try to blame you, even though they're the ones who encourage you to test and prod. Um, <clears throat> as far as uh, finding vulnerabilities. Um, I think Charles had a good point with yeah downloading uh, though downloading it uh, a copy to your local machine and basically testing it in your lab environment because that you that will be treated as 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 finding it on their own system. Um, 
they'll they'll try to triage it and make sure that you know that that it is indeed a valid finding and then however they however they give you whatever accolades whether it's through a payment or through swag or even a thank you um a lot of companies have different things like they have bug bounty programs where you can get paid for it and then they have um they have another one that's like a bug bounty program but it's called a vulnerability vulnerability disclosure program and that's where it's just typically like a hey thank you and we'll let you blog about it once we fix it um but like eric said look look you know check your local laws and air and 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 see what they say um it, it it can get real messy at times, like 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 the infamous F twelve or or there have been other incidents where people have disclosed certain things and they still try to punish them for it. So I would definitely make sure to check that you have the law on your side and make sure that you're protected. Um, and typically by doing it in your own environment, that's the best way to protect yourself because um, this way they can't say that you caused any potential harm to them. So that's it. Yeah. I'm, and, oh, Charles, you can go. No, I was going to say agreed. And also disclaimer out here, make sure that the code is available, is available for public consumption. If you got it from a tour site, it's probably not a good idea to work with it. Wait, wait. And, and furthermore, you might be right. You might be adding a back door to your own thing. <laughs> This is true. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's the other thing. When you when you download them, make sure you're there from trusted sites because if you don't know if you, if if you don't know how to read code or you don't plan on sifting through the source code for for an hour or two to make sure that the code is legit, you might I mean might end up down and thinking, oh yeah, this is this it's an exploit or 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 like like Charles said, yeah, it's a it, <laughs> this is this is a repo. But you might actually be giving them access to to your own system and making your PC a part of a botnet. So also look out for that as well. D just download from trusted sources. Yeah, remember, Froggy365 does not have your best interests at heart. <laughs> um yeah, and I'm I really like this direction that we're going. So I'm gonna I'm gonna keep digging further. So um it sounded like there's a couple of horror stories about um finding errors in prod who's got some stories that they're willing to share with the group and how did you as maybe either the finder or the person who was reported to you navigate that situation? Um well since I'm the one who brought it up, I guess I'll go first. Uh so I'm going to give a quick high level rundown because I don't want to name names and I don't want to break NDAs. But um, I was testing for a client. Um, typically, before you do a pen test, you have weeks of discussions for scope and, um, you know, scopes of work, uh, rules of engagement. If there's any um, accounts that you need created, uh, white listing of IP addresses and, and the whole nine. So during my during one of those calls, um, I told them that I needed access as a regular user. And I also needed an account of someone with elevated privileges. Um, there was definitely a language barrier issue there but every time i kept saying give me someone with elevated privilege like a, like an admin account or something they kept saying sure we'll give you root level access and i kept saying i don't want root i just want an elevated user you know on on this web application that, that's it and they kept saying yeah root and i'm going no admin so we went back and forth um this is where i say document 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 and uh and like clearly touched on earlier, documentation is is key, especially when you're doing these things, um, because at that point I emailed my boss and I made sure I sent it in the email. So there was a paper trail saying that, um, you know, I'm I, I this is what I said. This is what they're saying. I don't feel it moving forward with this until we get a clarification. But business has deadlines and they want the deadlines met. So they pushed on. 
day of the assessment. They we 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 do our um, kickoff call. They said the same thing. They said, yep, so we gave you this access with this account, and then this access has root. I'm like, I don't want root. Are you sure? I said admin. They said, yeah, we're saying the same thing. I said, okay. Emailed my, my advisor again saying, hey, just so you know, this is what they're saying. I'm real comfortable with it. They're saying continue on. Um, I get to doing the the initial mapping of the application. So when you're doing a web application, typically what they want you to do, what you should do is touch every part of the application, every input box, every button, every click you want to, you want to get as much of a, of an attack surface as possible. Um, and then after that, you can, you know, if it, at that time, after you do all of that, maybe you spider the site just in case to see if there's anything you missed. So this way you have a full, you have a, a full layout of what the application looks like in Burp Suite, so you're not missing anything, um, and you can then go on to your searching for vulnerabilities and and analysis and then exploitation and stuff. So I'm doing all of this. I get through my initial mapping, and then um, I run my spider. Um, I run the spider, <laughs> and as I'm running the spider, about five minutes in. My burp suite sees it, it like seized up like that. That's weird. That's that that doesn't happen normally. So I said, oh, maybe you know, maybe it's a lot going on. I'll give it a couple more minutes. Couple more minutes go by, and it's like the whole now the whole application frozen. So I'm like, okay, stop everything, and and let's just see what happens. So I stopped, waited five minutes, and then the call started pouring in. What happened? You broke the website. We're not able to take payments. Why would you test in prod? And a whole storm just came. Um, we ended up having to do a triage call. The person who kept giving me access, who kept saying, this is the access you need, immediately started denying that they gave me this access. Didn't know what went on. Um, it went on for about a week. Uh, they try. We end up having like like a, like a hearing. Like it felt like I was being court martialed. Um, but then in the call, they ended up actually admitting. They're like, "Oh yeah, we gave him access to prod." And they're like, "Well, why would you give him access to prod?" He said, "Well, that's what he asked for." I said, "Nope, actually, no. If you look here, this is what I asked for. This is the conversation I had. Here's the correspondence in the emails." And it ended up basically they they, they ended up basically having to eat the. The, the cost that they lost from those transactions because what happened was when it was during the burp spider, it was clicking, it was turning off different functions. And what it ended up doing was turning off a function that was a lot that, that allowed them to accept. Pay. So um, I won't disclose how much money they said they lost in that short time, but it was enough to sit there and go, Oh shit, I probably have to look for another job. So again, <laughs> never test in prod if you don't have to get and get everything in writing um, and just avoid prod like the plague. My goodness. I think we kind of had a similar situation. Only difference is this wasn't a, a payment application. It was a legacy application. But the only environment that they had was prod. They had no test environment. No dev environment, and we were well, pretty much as required. Like, hey, we have to meet this deadline. It was the fourth quarter, they're required by policy to have a pen test, a web app test every year, and it was crunch time. So, I'm like, okay, so we had our we had our team, we had our team's call, but after the team's call. I would always follow up with an email. Hey, per our conversation, um, I need this this account. I need all this information that I need to start testing. Are you sure? Because this is a production environment. Do you want me to even spider since this is legacy code? I mean, you know, I was asking all the right questions, right? So, long and behold, and <laughs> long and behold, the, the site crashes, right? And like I said, this is like old legacy buggy code in production site crashes burp spider just did a did a number on it again now 
I'm getting IMs. Oh, our our company, we, we're at a halt here. They're blaming our team, saying, "Hey, you guys messed up the site. This guy is, doesn't know what he's doing. Everything else, yeah, it, it got nasty." So they say, "Hey, we have a, we have a Teams call, right?" Now, mind you, he sent me all the information, telling me it was okay to do this. It's still production. Go ahead and do it. Everything else. So as we get on the Teams meeting, right? Again, similar situation. I don't remember saying that. <laughs> I don't remember seeing any of that information. Um, I think he just went without our authorization. Like he like really tried to turn it on me. And what I wound up doing as he was talking, I put the screenshots in the team's chat for everybody to see. As he was as he was talking, he was like, Well, you did I did no such thing. And, he, and then all of a sudden the screenshots just started appearing. And then he and then you could hear him over the thing because his camera was off. His conversation started changing. Well, I, I got I dumped through some emails. And I do realize, I do remember saying that <laughs> during the course of the call. But the thing is, if I didn't have, and this is why documentation is important, and screenshots, screenshots is an extra layer of protection. If I didn't have that, um, yeah, it would have been a world of hurt for me because it would have been my word against that person's word. So, yeah. Um, once again, scary story, but luckily, um, took my time to Document, screenshot, document again, document, document. I don't care if you have to ask the question a thousand times. Make sure they're saying the same answer a thousand times. That's my horror story. I still get chills about that to this day. Jesus. Yeah. Um, like both of you said, CYA is the word, the operative acronym in pen testing. And um, I had a similar in the U.S. government, I was doing a, uh, I wasn't doing a pen test. I was just doing a vulnerability assessment. Um, so some tools and we found out that one of their databases dropped and we went looking for this database like crazy. I found a, an Apple IIe that had been running for probably about 15 years in a closet by itself and was hosting this critical database, and nobody knew it was there. So so we document, document, document all the time to what we're doing, where we're, ta we're, we're targeting. Oh, my God. Wait, these stories, um, first of all, thank you all so much for sharing these stories. I feel like these are the stories that people need to hear for practicing safe pen testing. And I'm super glad y'all are coming through and being vulnerable and sharing these stories um, because there's so much to learn from here. So as someone getting into the field, it's really easy for your coworkers to throw you under the bus. How do you, in the moment, stay level-headed when you might be getting thrown under the bus? I'm going to let them go first because I don't have a, I don't have yeah. a right. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's the wrong person to ask. No, okay. Um, okay, so um it is it is hard. It is hard, and it's a lesson that you have to learn over and and I'm sorry guys, you sometimes you don't you do you, you don't stay level headed, and that's when you learn your lessons. Um, like you heard Charles and Davint talk um make sure the thing again it goes back to document 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 your rules of engagement your your sow your anything that as you're doing the pen test you got to remember that just like you're doing a court case a forensics case so every time you request something you take a screenshot every time they give you something you take a screenshot you 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 make your list of things. And, and I didn't learn this until later on in my career that you needed to go to that level because that's going to happen. If, if the worst thing happens, it is human nature to first say, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. I didn't do it. So that's when you have to say, you know, with all due respect, 
here is what you provided me and this is this this the the tasks that i did and that is what it led to this so that after action that prepare pre preparation for that after action um it's going to help you when you're writing your report and it's going to help you if you are in a you know in one of these negative situations so document 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 take pictures take screenshots make sure you know what's going on okay um, I'm super excited, Kiki, that you raised your hand because I definitely I want to hear your input about documenting <laughs> and legal. This is this is exactly what I was going to ask next. So please, what are you? Yeah. There? So remember how I started off this conversation about documentation and about GRC and the whole nine. Pen testing has to tie back into these risk registers that we are creating, things of that nature, you need to have documentation. We don't know that you did what you said you did unless we have the documentation. And so it was a chuckle at first, but now people are starting to really understand GRC is not the laughing stock of this community uh, or or this industry it is more so the heart of it you have to abide by these rules regulations and 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 what have you in order for you to be successful here this has to happen and we have to start with training people with the mindset of if you do a pen test, even if you're doing a practice pen test, start learning how to document that and write that up so you have proof and you have evidence of what it is that you have done. So that way, when we come to collect evidence as the GRC going through high trust, SOC 1, SOC 2 audits, you know what I mean? Things of that nature, we have that evidence and don't have to worry about it. And you don't have to worry about it either. But if you're doing things with no documentation, it's going to be a problem. Some way or another, it is going to be a problem. And that's all I wanted to say. I just really quickly wanted to ask, for those who don't know, what is GRC? Governance, risk, which is risk management, risk registers, things of that nature, and compliance. That's what GRC is. And those are the things that you should be complying by when you're doing pen tests. So it all ties back into each other. Like it, it's 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 not like we got pen testers here, we got GRC people here, we got blue teamers, red team. Like we are all within the same community. When you really think about it, we all tie into one another in, into one another's jobs. I can't successfully say I'm going to create a risk register. If I don't pen test in those reports from those pen tests to say, okay, this is what we need to work on. This is how they got in here. How do we combat that? How do we take it a step further and, and, and make it so they can't get in here like that? Those are That's the things that we are getting from those pen test reports. So that reporting and documentation is very important. I know one thing. You, just just the voice alone made me nervous. I would not want you coming for me. I am very, I am very thorough. I, you know what though? I'm 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 a fun person and I'm very funny. However, you know, when it comes to certain things, it's just like, you got to be clear cut. Like, you got to be straight to the point. And I'm not trying to scare nobody or nothing like that, but I think maybe we need to start scaring pen testers into understanding how important the reporting aspect 
is the documentation is like I totally agree. yeah i was i was gonna say the same thing i i i not to cut anybody off but yeah one one yeah i, I wouldn't want kiki hitting me up like right before compliance but um <laughs> But no, she makes she makes a valid point, um, especially if you're working depend if you're working for a medical facility or you're working, you know, for a fintech company and you have to wor worry about things like HIPAA and, and PCI. You want to make sure that your documentation is always up to date. Um, and just to just to, I guess, to, to circle back to the original question about dealing with difficult people. Um, like I said, it, I'm a work in progress. Um like I'm not gonna sit here and give the kumbaya answer because um, I'm also the, the same person who will pull up on you at the lunchroom. <laughs> so um, it, it 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 you just have to tell yourself that you know, um, like Eric said, CYA. Like Charles said, you know, document, 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 and and make sure that you know you're able to stand on whatever it is you speak to, um, because people will you know, mistakes will happen. That, that, that's inevitable. And people will try to throw you under the bus if it feels like they need to, you know, if, if self-preservation come, comes into play. Um, so you just need to make sure that, you know, your stuff is all set and it's legit and there's no certain nothing in your story and you can stand, you can stand by your truth. Um, like I said, I'm not the person to, to, to explain how to, how, how to woosa. Uh, cause I'm, I, I, I constantly have to seek, uh, counsel and advice on that. Um, but like I said, it, it can get frustrating. Like I said, it, it, it has been frustrating in the past. I've, yes, I have, well, I've have run up on people in during, like it, it, after a call to go and just, just so you know, I'm the person that was on the other line that you were talking real spicy to. Um, I don't condone that. Um, I'm not proud of that, but it it comes with the territory. So just make sure your stuff is solid. Jake, I'm so excited your hand is up because I wanted to ask next. Please chime in. <laughs> yeah, no, I it's probably a little bit off topic at this point, but I I did want to add something because I know Kiki had like an excellent point. She put it like super super well. Um, but I think like a really like blunt way to pl put it is that a lot of the things that like we'll do as pen testers are, you know, otherwise considered illegal outside of like a contractual agreement. So, you know, the, the documentation is is super key. And, and Devin and Charles had are, are living proof of this with the stories that they shared. But, um, you know, th that that is it is really, really crucial. Um, and especially, uh, I can't remember who exactly was sharing the, um, <laughs> the story of, uh, causing somebody to lose a ton of money. Um, but you know, that that's exactly why. And you, you look at like maybe somebody that's on like an executive board, um, who's not, doesn't know every single operation that's happening internally. Um, you know, it, all they know is that they're, they're, e-commerce site for say went down they can't make money and now they're looking to point a finger so you know even though you were doing stuff that's legal and in a contractual agreement you can you know you can bet that they're going to turn around and they want they want blame they want somebody to blame and technically like the stuff that you're doing kind of illegal if it wasn't in the in the scope of what you're doing and if it isn't in the contract to to do it so um, I, I know I'm kind of beating a dead horse, but they, they all put that really, really, really well. Um, and I, I did want to touch on that again really quick. Um, so it goes, wanted to come through and speak. And then we have one more request about this topic too. So please come through. So it goes. Yeah, I just had like a, I wanted to bridge the, any gap between what Kiki was saying and about GRC and consuming a pen test report, right? And it really, I, as a person that used to pen test, but now I'm a consumer of pen test information from a leadership position. And it's incredibly important that the documentation resulting from a pen test, and we're not going to talk about bug bounty programs or anything like that, but from a, an engagement where you've engaged with a pen tester or a pen test, a company, 
to conduct a pen test or uh, a red team exercise or a purple team exercise with you, um, that what that report that we're looking for be one actionable so that the things that um, really good pen testers can find, uh, we can try to remediate. Right. And then also from a GRC standpoint, a lot of companies, and I think this is kind of where Kiki is coming from, they're on the hook to provide the information that they know about their vulnerabilities, that they've taken action to remediate those vulnerabilities and track that in a holistic year long process and for SOC reporting on a month by month process. So the the report back and the information that you're getting from a engagement pen test like has all of these desired outputs that as a consumer of those reports and a user of those reports to continue our security program, it's uh, just super important for everybody that's a receiver of those reports to have something actionable and have something that they can fix and possibly pay you again to do another test and show that they've remediated those items, both for their internal tracking and for their compliance tracking and providing to auditors. And then also for customers and clients to show that they want to trust a company with their data. It's a, it's an important part of a lot of business development for companies that are trying to bring in other people into their data environment, like Microsoft, Azure. That's why they their compliance page is just reads like a list of certifications and compliance things like SOC 2 and ISO. It's because they want everyone's data and they want to have a clear path to it for any company that has a requirement that a, whoever they're going to trust with their data have those things in place. That was awesome. I'm also going to bring up uh, James. Right. Now. Do, 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 do. Hello. Oh, they muted themselves. Oh, what, was it? Are you good with me speaking now? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, um, I really didn't have much to share uh, other than the fact that uh, you all were talking about recording earlier. And I use a really awesome tool that I think everyone should check out. It's called Fireflies.ai. And um, I'm really ADHD. So uh, if I have to have a tool where I manually have to add something to a meeting for it to record, I probably will never use it. But what Fireflies does is it will automatically join my meetings beforehand. Like I don't have to click anything and it will record and transcribe the meetings. Wait, I'm smiling from ear to ear because that's like my former college friend is the founder of that. So it's super cool to hear that you use it. Love Fireflies. It is one of my favorite tools I've ever downloaded or used. Oh my god, wait, that's a oh, small world. Sam Wudadong is going to cry. Oh my god, I can't wait to tell him. Um, but, um, okay, so for the people who are in the chat, I'm really loving this direction that we're going, and we're getting so much good information about, like, staying protected um, and staying safe. Um, and so I'm super curious, and I kind of was up to the audience now as we're we're getting into the second half of this chat. Like, does the audience have questions for our pros here? I can continue to just ask horror stories that people don't want to share or if people don't want to ask. I really want to make sure this is an open conversation, but we do have a request. And so I'm here to add them as a speaker. Hello. Welcome to the stage, Christian Galvin. Hey, how's it going, guys? Uh, so really informal uh, chat going on. So I'm really happy uh, that you guys opened it up to the audience. So I'm a prior pen tester and now I've moved into security engineering, but I still love the pen test uh, work. So I guess the question for the pros is uh, what's the situation that you've had where like the scope was going well, everybody seemed to be on board. And then like, uh, I guess something happened like miscommunication that, uh, you know, just things didn't go well and you really had to do some like, uh, damage control. and what what are your tips for when that happens um, I've had a couple 
Um, I've had one where it's called, we call it a scope creeping where the client or the customer might try to change the scope mid assessment. Um, I had one where I um, basically <clears throat> ran a cross site request forge revulnerability and I was able to get all the way up to like admin level access with it. And uh, the 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 network team, the guy who was my point of contact, um, typically how that pen tested worked was uh, if you found something, a major vulnerability, you you actually stopped and had a quick call and reported it right then and there, uh, where traditionally you would do a pen test and then write up the report and then then disclose the findings in the report and in the in the, the debrief meeting. Uh, but that one, we had to actually report it as we found it. And I remember the gentleman kept trying to remediate the issue. And every time he tried to remediate it and I retested it, I was still able to, to, to recreate the exploit. And this was like, this was like day one or two. So this was like Monday or Tuesday of the assessment. And then by like Wednesday afternoon, um, we get called into a meeting and the guy says, well, that's out of scope anyway. So we should we, we don't have to fix it. And it's your fault because you shouldn't have tested when it wasn't in scope. Um, but I think the, the, the same thing that we talked about earlier about. CYA and having your paperwork uh, that also came in handy because I had a copy. I actually printed out the original scope of the pen test. So when they showed the, when they showed the scope and they showed the list of applications and whitelisted um, URLs and IP addresses, I then opened up my my <laughs> my copy of the scope that was given to me the week prior and showed that there was a difference there. So, um, again, uh, it's all about keeping documentation and, 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 you know, staying true to what you're supposed to do. Um, that's, that's, that's my example. Pretty much just a, just a piggyback and, um, kind of went through the, like I said, like I said earlier, um, a similar scenario where, where I'm just gonna say the client got amnesia, and he had to be quickly reminded through um, a Teams conversation with screenshots in order for him to change his um, opinion. But just in general, if if something's not going well, I, I will tell you, first step, breathe, breathe. One, two. Make sure that you go back, you take, you stop whatever it is that you're doing. You go back and collect all of the documentation from the beginning of the engagement. And I'm talking about from the, the kick, the time of the kickoff meeting up to the point where there was actually a problem. Right. And you sort through the documentation, make sure that you, you, you touch on all the points, make sure that you actually know how everything went like the conference from the conversation up till now right that way you could be prepared to answer any questions so that they say hey um this was out of scope right and you can say well during the kickoff meeting you said at this time and you had you provide documentation that actual that person said hey um this particular url is in scope you know um and you did tell me to and i'm just using um Davin's example too. Um, you did tell me, hey, um, this was in scope. And in the event of anything that critical happens, stop testing and notify me what happens. You know, so it's all just, again, just covering your tracks. But I will <laughs> recommend the first thing you want to do is breathe. Because if you if you don't and take if you don't take time and you come into a situation where you're emotional and they're emotional, it can, it can end badly. Wow, thank you so much for those uh, examples. And it gives me, it's like a sanity check just to realize that like, you know, when that happens, when that's happened to me in the past, like, like it wasn't like a, 
like a case in the vacuum. Like, you know, it's pretty common for other people. And th- thanks for the tips on the documentation. Anytime. Uh, Kiki brought her brought their hand back up, so bring them back up. I just wanted to say I'm not going to say nothing, but I said something earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say nothing, but I did say something earlier. It was no, it was no. we, we need to hear it again. Say it again. I'm not going <laughs> to say nothing. But GRC Queen said something earlier. Sora, stop barking. All right, thanks. I'm I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. Uh, <laughs> I guess um, I would actually like to kind of ask, based off this last question, what happens if you do find something out of scope? Um, it was kind of touched on, but let's just jump in further into that scenario. Like, what do you do? Stop. Don't don't go any further. I would say that um, if you do run into something, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, oh, if you do if you do run into something, so for example, especially, and this happens a lot when you're testing like web applications in general. You can be you can have something that's in scope, but then it may redirect you to a page that's out of scope. If it looks weird, it probably is weird, and the best thing you can do. If you feel like that it might not be in scope, just stop. Don't go any further. Even if even if there's a vulnerability on that particular page, even if there's an issue with that particular page you got redirected to, stop. Notify the the, the point of contacts. Then they're like, hey, during the time of the testing, I was redirected this particular page. Is this in scope? If they say yes. Like, okay, perfect. Now I know there's a scope. Also, I noticed there's a particular, you know, if there's a particular issue or bug or whatnot, you can report that, add that into the conversation as well, too. And let them tell you in writing, not in, the, not in voice, in writing, that it's okay to, to continue on or that vulnerability is something that we already know about. Let them do what they want to see happen. But let them tell you that in writing. Yeah, it's funny that you guys actually um, asked this question because I, I kind of asked a, a similar question to um, one of my like mentors at work uh, literally like two days ago. Um, and some of the smartest people that like I swear I've ever talked to in my entire life uh, had like a very similar answer. And, you know, they said it, it, it's highly dependent on what your engagement is like, um, who the client is, what the, how far out of scope is it, you know, like um, kind of like they were just saying, you know, is, is it a redirect to a completely different site? Like, is this going to be on an entire different company site? Is this just, you know, maybe, uh, a, a login page where the uh, the actual application is out of scope and they just want you to test things from the outside, but maybe you're able to perform an authentication bypass and get inside. Um, but I do think, you know, they, they kind of said you, you go back to client and you got to make sure those things are are set in stone. You got to make sure that um, that they're OK with that, especially if it's something where, you know, it, it's internal. Um if you're able to to gain something that's out of scope and it's internal, got to make sure that uh, the the client is okay with it, um, and that it's again well documented because you know it's going outside of uh, a, 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 an agreement. Yeah, let me um, add two cents here as a so now i'm going to look at this as a CISO or client okay so when something is out of scope um there's two things that you should always do document stop 
well, three things, document, stop, and inform, okay? That's very important. And the, and the reason for that is twofold. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the positive feel here, okay? Is as a client, I might have done with my team a scope, a rules of engagement, et cetera, et cetera, with you guys, the pen testers, but I don't know what I don't know. And sometimes we don't know what we don't know. So maybe you did find something that was out of scope. When you, when you document and inform me, I might say, yes, that, you know, I would like you to test that and let's amend the rules of engagement or the scope of work. If no, I say, hey, this is going from this application to an SAP system and I don't want you to touch that. You know, yes, let's stop right there. Thanks for letting us know that that's redirecting. Maybe we didn't even that it was redirecting there. So it is, it can be a, if done right, it can be a good communication between that pen testing vulnerability assessment team to say, hey, did you know that your system is going this way or that it can do that? Um, so it does help you know, on the, on the leadership side to know these things. So again, like everybody else said, stop, document, inform. And that's always going to be your safest bet. Yeah, that was really well put, Eric. I'm, apologies to everybody else too. I kind of realized that I, I don't know how soon I cut my, uh, cut myself off there. I was right dog to get something away from him that he wasn't supposed to have. So I appreciate that, Eric. That was, that was really well put. And that was pretty much what I was trying to get out. I think we have a new acronym here, people. DSI document, stop and inform. I do SDI stop document and inform. <laughs> stop yourself quickly. <laughs> this is very exciting i love this now we're gonna see this acronym pop up everywhere so if you're listening and you're gonna start writing blog posts y'all better use this and credit this group chat thank you <laughs> um i guess i would really love to hear if you um i i personally love actionable advice so if you were someone who's in my shoes um who's new to the world of pen testing um what actionable advice would you give to me oh i feel like i could probably speak on this one pretty well um given the fact that you know i'm i'm three weeks into full-time pen testing um i did like internal before um, I graduated college like a year ago, so I'm very, you know, I'm very green in the field compared to a lot in here. There's a lot of very, very experienced professionals in here that are, um, you know, way, way smarter than I am at this point um, in the field. But I, I do have um, a very fresh experience in terms of transitioning into pen testing. Um, and I think one of the things that I found the most success with um, is kind of what we were talking about at the beginning. Um, but it, it's just having the, I, I, the thing that worked the best for me was just having the determination to keep learning. You know, the more and more that I um, learn and do this on a daily basis, um, the more I've realized that it, it's impossible to know everything. And I know it seems like, you know, some of the smartest people know everything, um, but I promise you they don't. Um, and even the smartest people will tell you that they don't know everything. So um, really just having the determination to keep wanting to learn things that you don't know um, and, and want to tinker around, like go on hack the box, mess around, see what you can learn, even if it's just, you know, something small um, for a day, you know, maybe you learn what FTP is one day. Um, maybe you do bug bounty programs. You don't even really know exactly what you're looking for, but you're doing things. You're trying, you're putting yourself out there. Um, you're wanting to learn, having that want to learn, 
um, is really going to set you apart from uh, a lot of other people out there. It, just in my experience. Yeah. Amen, brother. Amen. Listen, one of the things that my father once taught me that I want to impart here is an old phrase by play. I only know that I know nothing. Okay. And it doesn't matter if you've been in the industry for one year, three weeks, like you into your, into your place or 30 years or 20 years like Davin and Charles, you know, um, you know, if I didn't keep on learning, if we didn't keep on learning, I started out with Vax VMSs and deck machines with, with punch cards. Where do you think I would be right now? Okay. So everything that I learned in college, everything that I learned in my first three years are, are in museums. So if you don't keep up learning, if you don't keep on, on honing your skills, every two, three years, the technology that we're using changes. So every year, we're newbies. Every time a new system comes on, we're newbies. So just keep on learning, keep on experimenting, keep on hacking, you know, hack not, you know, hack not crime. So let's, let's keep on learning. Yes. <laughs> and oh, sorry. Told, I was not trying to cut you off, Charles. Sorry. No, um, you're fine. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I, I think I actually like saw this for the first time because, you know, I, I move into this new um, consulting role and I work with some brilliant people almost to the point where, you know, you see the things that some people have done. You're like, wow, that's incredible. How am I going to get there? Um, but then you see something come out where um, I was actually interviewing when Log4j hit. Um, and I had a conversation with some of the, uh, you know, senior consultants um, that I was interviewing with. And it was so cool to see because it was developing. Um, nobody really knew. Nobody was an expert on it. And these people were are brilliant in this field. Some of the smartest people I've ever talked to. Um, and they knew just as much as... I did from reading articles. So it's really, really cool to see um, people that have been in the field for 30 years um, kind of learn something alongside you. Um, and, and it's, you know, I'm just kind of reiterating the point that you just made. But, you know, they, they'd never seen this before in their entire career. Um, and they are brilliant and have had excellent careers in the field. So they're really, really um, eager learners. And I, I've found that is one of one of the best skills that you can have and it, it is cool so if anybody needs a little imposter syndrome squishing tonight there you go <laughs> yeah i mean um eric made me shed a digital tear about the vac systems even though i'm novell certified <laughs> <laughs> but where would that get me today? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Netware was the was was a bomb back then, right? Now, now mind you, I I'm, I'm Netware 4. So it was before TCP <laughs> was even inducted. <laughs> we'll talk later, buddy. <laughs> yeah, Yasha Yasha Yasha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um no, but but I think everybody touched on it already. Um, never stop learning. Never stop learning. Uh, that's one of the things that drew me to this field was that it's always changing. It's always challenging. Um, like Eric said, th you know, technology is always changing two to three years. Well, Moore's Law is every 18 months. That um, Every 18 months, tech the newest technology becomes obsolete in 18 months. So... Um, you know, the way I see it is if they're saying that technology <laughs> grows obsolete every 18 months, then so will your skill set. So always sharpen up your skills. Um, never get complacent. Never think <laughs> never think you're too good to to, you know, to get replaced. Um, because uh, like these two gentlemen said, what what good will those certifications get you now? Um, when one of them was before TCP was even a thing, um, you know, that's the, that same thing with, um, certain certifications, like, you know, Microsoft certifications back in the day, what good are they now when everything is in the cloud? So always, 
always be prepared to learn something new. Always be prepared to put in the work. Always practice. Um, there's always something new you can you can learn or something you can work on in pen testing. Um, you know. Did he drop again? What? Just a. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 you go. I think it might be him. Yeah, yeah. Um, but just to piggyback real quick, what he said until he comes back in. But yeah, always keep learning. Um, and don't forget, e even if it's like old knowledge to someone else, it's still new to you. So, you know, there's a lot of a lot of times like when you're when you're working on something like that. You, you, you're like, okay, I need to hunt for forgotten knowledge because that's important as well, too. Because again, the, the stuff that you're working with, you're always constantly learning. When you learn something, you be like, oh my goodness, I didn't realize like this is how everything works. It's kind of like you put the pieces of the puzzle together. And once you figure that out, man, I mean, the, the sky's the limit. And again, you, you'll never be bored. You should never be bored in this field. Whether you continue, you don't do another day of penetration testing and you move over to like, say, maybe GRC or maybe if you move over to forensics or whatever it is that you're learning, you should never be bored in this field. There's always something that you can learn in this field and it never ends. It never stops, you know. So yeah. that, that's the best advice I can I, <laughs> I could definitely give you, you know. Let me add to what Charles just said is each one teach one, each one pull each other up. It doesn't matter if you've been in the, in the field for one month. There's always somebody behind you that's just starting, okay? Share your knowledge. Share what you have learned. Each one teach one. Don't forget that. That's going to help you in your career. One of the best ways to, to learn is to teach. OK, so teach and support your fellow, your, your fellow person there, support each other. We have a really bad problem. If you guys look at what happens on Twitter and all these social media and all this, you know, Davin has on his uh, on his um, on his merch store, a T-shirt that says I survived InfoSec Twitter or something or InfoSec Twitter veteran, I the, the phrase. But we have an issue, and we need to change that from right now. Each one, teach one. Stop putting each other down. InfoSec, InfoSec, cybersecurity, whatever you want to call it, okay, is a team sport, period. Nobody can do it alone. So, sorry, I'm going to get off my high horse here. I was trying to find the emoji for a digital hug because <laughs> that is so that, that is so true. And if it don't challenge you, it don't change you. So definitely take it as a challenge. As you learn stuff, teach stuff. And, you know, you'd be surprised how much knowledge you accumulate just by doing that alone. You know, you never you I, I guarantee and I guarantee you, you look back and be like, oh, man. And you'd be surprised how many people you actually help. Because I, I, I guarantee you, you will never lose helping somebody else win. I guarantee you that. Um, I got, I got, I keep getting kicked off, so I'm gonna speak quick before I get kicked off again. Um, no, I agree a hundred percent. Um, as far as you know, um, you know, lifting is you build. So you, you know, as you build in yourself up, help lift others. A blog and. I think to date, my most successful blog still is um, me writing how I failed an exam. Um, and I just wrote that to just kind of get it off my chest and, and you know, do something different. Because a lot of the times you see people out here just kind of sharing the success stories and not sharing, you know, that they failed or that they screwed up. And I decided an article to talk about how I failed my first crack at the OSCP. and. And, and in reflection, what I did wrong and how I misjudged it and and um, what I plan to do to improve. And 
that has been the most successful article, mainly because of the responses that I got. And it also helped so many people. There were so many people who reached out to me privately as well as publicly who said, you know, thank you for doing this because had I known, I probably would have made the same mistakes you did. So you never know who's paying attention um, and, and whose life you can possibly change or thought process you can alter. Um, I don't, I, I caught, I caught the tail end of, of, of Eric's um, soapbox, but um, yeah, don't let InfoSec Twitter uh, bring you down because it can. <laughs> and um, yeah, the shirt is called InfoSec Twitter veteran. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> but um, also to, to, to say too, I too failed the OSCP, and I'm saying it live on the recording, people. I too failed the OSCP the first time around because I didn't know and understand buffer overflows. So after I failed, I went back and practice on buffer overflows and wound up passing it the second time. Yeah. Don't forget, fail is first attempt in learning. I have a big sign that says that. First attempt in learning. You got to fail. Fail, fail forward. I just want to I'm gonna yeah, let's um so it goes your mic is having a moment and it sounds like you are speaking from the other side of an empty convention hall. Um but P H underscore raise their hand, so I'm gonna give the floor to them. Hi. Um just wanna say that um learning um is is um is hard sometimes, and and sometimes people can get um, way too caught up to catching up with other people that you see around you. So, uh, what I noticed, and I fell into that same trap where I try to do way too many things, and then get burned out from my own uh, attempt at education. So, um, be mindful. Um, I would say to try to learn at your own pace and not compare yourself to others. And in in my uh, case where I'm currently a security architect and, and I'm picking up um, pen testing uh, skills where I'm trying for the OSAP, which I've failed a few times already, lost count. <laughs> but um, I'm still, um, you know, trying for all other uh, certifications. But that, doesn't mean that um, uh, people, uh, when they look at me, they, they should exactly follow and try to catch up um, because everyone learns in pace and you you know yourself um, better or best. Then try not to burn yourself up and on top of all the other duties and sacrifice or your par- private life and things like that. And the other point, um, I just want to say, um, it's easy in a, in this industry where you can uh, migrate horizontally somehow, and there's so many opportunities. Um, I, I went from a server uh, guy to a network guy, and then finally to a firewall and and the architect guy, and and I think uh, the only limitation really is the op- uh, the the maybe the perceived um, things that you restrict yourself with. So so mentally, um, sometimes uh, for me, I feel that I'm not going to try this job probably because um, I may not have the skills or experience to, to go for, but that's something uh, is worth trying to pick up relevant skills and, and, and see whether the opportunity arise and, and go for it anyway. Thank you. Awesome. Um, unless anyone else has any other questions, I guess, I guess we can shut down the room, but Jake definitely has something that they want to share. 
Yeah, I just I know I know we're kind of running short on time, so I just had one other quick thing that I wanted to add because I thought PH brought up a really good point there, um, and I kind of noticed it with myself too. Um, and being able to learn at your own pace is, I think, really crucial, um, especially being on InfoSec Twitter. And this kind of ties back to like Davin's whole like I survived Info- InfoSec Twitter thing. It's really easy to just scroll through um, Twitter and see a bunch of people passing them or, you know, getting a job, and maybe you're not there yet. Um, but one thing that I, uh, that was extremely helpful was just being like brutally honest with myself. Um, I, you know, you don't on some fixed timeline, you don't have to know buffer overflows in two weeks. You don't have to know some specific topic in a set period of time. You know, if you don't know something, just be honest with yourself. Don't pretend like you parse it and, and lie to yourself. You know, take your time. There's, it's the, this career isn't a race. You have a ton of time to learn things. Um, and uh, I found when I actually started this with myself and know when I know things and, you know, be able to take a step back and say, you know what? I did not do so great um, trying that SQL injection without any hints. Maybe I need to go back and revisit that. That's when I saw the most growth in myself. Um, and I, I just thought PH made a really good point about that. So I wanted to add that really quick. But thank you guys for giving me the second to add that. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for coming in with that last uh, nugget of wisdom. But um, I think that we're done with this. Um, Parker? Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody that came by. I know we had been kind of a little bit of a long space, but I think everybody really all of our speakers brought some really great information, a lot of great stories. Um, so thank you so much, everybody that came and talked, as well as everybody that came and listened. Um, before we wrap things up, I do want to say tomorrow is Eric's birthday. Woo! So um, if everybody wants to drop a little hundred, if only they had like birthday emojis. Um I'll give a little bit of shout out to Eric, who had a really awesome um, episode of his show earlier today, highlighting a really important um, cause for domestic violence and how people can um, provide a lot of security, both in terms of like um, different services they get offered online um, to help people who are victims of domestic violence. Yep. So, and I'd love to hear Eric. If you don't mind, Parker, let me say two things. First, I know that unfortunately he dropped, but I want to publicly com- congratulate uh, Davin Jackson. Um, he is the new host of Hacker Valley uh, for these next uh, season. Um, so congratulations to him. If you didn't see his show yesterday where he announced it, go look at DJX Alpha on, on YouTube and catch that show. And uh, he is an amazing person to follow. He is a, uh, a good friend, and he will guide you through a lot of these, these challenges. So follow him definitely on, uh, here on Twitter and his uh, show on uh, YouTube. Um, and then second, um, you know, I just wanted to take this moment to uh, plug the uh, Raices Cyber Organization, which is our organization to help bring in more Hispanics, Latinos, Latinas into the field of cybersecurity. So if you have any questions, DM me, ping me on, on Twitter um, and follow us there because that's uh, that we're supposed we're helping bring up not just Hispanics, Latinos, Latinas. That's our priority, but um, all our allies as well. So so if you if you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks, Parker. Yep, absolutely. Thank you, Eric. Yep, definitely go check out uh, Davin's channel. It was a really cool uh, kind of surprise announcement that he had. So, um, again, thank you so much to everybody that came out. Um, This space is recorded, so it should be available for anybody who wants to listen if you maybe came in late um, as well. It'll also be put up in podcast form probably, I'd like to say, in the next week, but... um, I've got a few more to do, um, catch up on. So definitely keep your eye out. Thank you so much, everybody that's here. Ali, thanks so much for moderating and leading the space. This is definitely a great topic. Um, 
And yeah, we'll catch you everybody else in about two weeks for our next one. So have a good night, everybody.